Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for coming to this presentation. This is the Confronting Disparities Through Evidence. This is the AWEM um, Research in Progress meeting or presentation. Okay. So, disclosures um, I'm Pooja Agrawal. I'm on the board of directors of SAM. I'm a former president of AWEM. Um, and disclosures for our, present for our presenters Dr. Chari. Sai Moulton uh, are funded through the AWEM Research Funding Award, um, and Drs. Parson and Batikloli were funded by the SAM Foundation um, AWEM grant. <clears throat> so just to give you a sense of this, the AWEM Research Funding Award um, is something that AWEM uh, presents every year. Um, it, it supports projects that are aligned with the mission of AWEM. And it has the, the secondary function of really supporting AWEM members um, doing often kind of smaller, often unfunded work uh, to help them moving forward with some of their research uh, uh, endeavors in the future. So it's ideal for pilot projects. There's a small amount of funding to get you some seed funding things. That otherwise may not have any money associated with it to um, fund maybe a research assistant, to fund some um, incentive for, for your for your projects, um, and generally something that you're not really going to be able to get a lot of funding for otherwise. It, minimal requirements from AWEM, this, there's very little minimal, there's minimal uh, reporting. Um, we ask you to present at this national forum, which you can also put on your CV at the end of it, um, and then just basically use your money as you said that you would, but it's not a grant that you have to actually come back and tell us a lot about in, in the interim. Um, and we make it very easy. The application itself, it's not a very long application. It's just a couple of key components to it. You have to give us a budget. And as long as it's reasonable and it's aligned with the AWEM mission, um, we, are, we are excited to hear about the work that you want to do. Um, and it does provide a forum for presentation. Both you get um, uh, this kind of a forum um, as well as potentially the, the option for submitting abstracts to the national meetings, to this national meeting and other national meetings. Um, and, and finally, we get to stimulate ideas, right? So we get to hear about what it is that you're looking to do. Um, you get to bring up junior residents and students who might be interested in similar work. We get to hear in the room how we can all collaborate and think about areas that, um, that, are, that are really focused on the advancement of women um, in academic emergency medicine. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody, I think. It's, I, as I was putting these slides together, I was thinking about, well, what have we done, right? This was just started in 2020, so around the pandemic. Um, and to take stock of how far we've come in four years, we have been able to fund 17 projects, over 60 investigators who are AWEM investigators. And out of that, the outputs have been papers. Here are just two examples of papers. So within four years, people have come up with their ideas, submitted IRBs, gotten the funding, done their projects, written it up, submitted it to a journal, and been published. These are just two examples of two of the papers that have come out of this particular effort, which is really incredible papers, national presentations, new ideas, uh, new research partnerships and collaborations, further studies, additional funding, perhaps policy change, we don't know, but you know, there's certainly a, a ripple effect. So this is something I think we're very proud of is there, there is now kind of a, a track record for this actually working really well. So I'm excited to hear um, kind of in the future how this continues to progress. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to let our amazing researchers speak now. This is just a rundown of our five presentations today, a mix of people who were funded within the last year, within the last few years, some who are um, uh, AWEM Research Award winners, some who are Foundation Grant winners. Um, and I'm going to let them really speak for themselves here. So we're going to start off with our first presentation. Um, Dr. Sue is going to present uh, gender and decision making about restraints in the emergency department. Hello, I'm Michelle Sa. I'm one of the third year residents at Baylor, um, and I worked on this project with Dr. Anita Chari. So I think we've all been on shift where things are chaotic but running smoothly and then you kind of sense a disturbance in the force and then you see kind of like loud noises, lots of motion, the nurse is kind of running by you with the soft restraints and she's like, hey, do you want me to grab the B-52? So that's really kind of the experience that this research project was born out of. I think in those moments, the decision about restraining patients can become like a very high risk um, situation, both in terms oops, for safety ramifications both for like the patient as well as the staff members 
And we felt like in those moments, clinical leadership is really key for either you know, controlling the chaos in a productive way and dialing down the temperature of the room. And that these kind of high acuity situations are not unlike other crisis situations in medicine, whether it's cardiac arrests or traumas or even rapid responses. The literature shows that in, you know, for codes and tra um, trauma situations that there are gender differences seen in leadership styles um, as well as in outcomes. And our research project really sought to see if we could see similar gender differences um, when it comes to the decision making around restraint use. This was our research team. It was a mix of medical students, residents, um, as well as attendings. And it was mostly EM, but we also had some psych representation. And so we chose to do a um, qualitative study based in our academic um, urban emergency department. It actually has like quite a high percentage of behavioral health patients. And it's also, I think, unique in having an associated psychiatric ER kind of housed within the ED. We conducted a series of semi-structured one-on-one -on -one interviews with attending physicians. And the interview topics really ranged from you know, decision-making about restraint use, as well as like the care team dynamics. We did intentionally not ask explicitly um, about gender kind of in a way to avoid the Hawthorne-esque effect and wanted to see more organic responses and like if gender would be addressed and if so, like how it would present. And then we used like a deductive inductive analysis and then coded responses kind of through that gender lens. This is our sample demographics. We interviewed 18 attendings, um, about a mix 50-50 of men and women. Um, all of these demographic characteristics were self-identified um, from the attendings with an average practice year of about, 50 of about 10 years. 50% of our sample was white and then a quarter Asian and a quarter black and then about like 10% Hispanic. And the majority had practice at other institutions as well as our um, academic ER. So I think unsurprisingly, the universal factors um, mentioned by both men and women included, I think I added feedback, anyway, included um, patient factors. So these things would be whether you know the patient was intoxicated, prior attempts at de-escalation, was the patient very large and posing a physical threat. Um, people also mentioned like staff safety, which is pretty self-explanatory as well as the care team dynamics. And so that included both like interactions with nurses, tech, other staff, as well as input. And then 100% um, of the women attendings had mentioned um, like the safety and like the idea of harm to the patient. And then about 90% of male attendings mentioned that as well. But I think in our project, we ended up seeing two major points where gender um, came into play. The first one was really through like a linguistic phenomenon of qualification. So at some point in the interviews, the attendings would always be asked, you know, at the end of the day, who makes the final call? And like 100% of male attendings said like, it's me. Uh, while women attendings kind of eventually landed at it's me, we did see like more of qualification, whether it was um, talking about like the need for input from others, um, you know, staff members or like, I really do appreciate like what our nurses have to say, but then ultimately it's me. And so I think on this slide, you can see examples um, of the men's responses where they say not only it's me, but even like, I'm willing to go against what the nurses say, or like, I'm okay if people are gonna disagree with me at the end of the day, it's my call. Whereas on the right side, you can see like, um, two out of the nine women had said, you know, like, I think it's really a joint decision by me and the nurses, or you know, like if the nurses and I like aren't quite sure, I'll like happily call in psychiatry, and then we can like make that joint decision. I think that bottom right corner was the most typical response by our female attendings, where they said like, um, you know, I think a lot of people have been watching the patient, and it's a lot of like input, but at the end of the day, like it will be my call. The other area where we saw gender come into play was the idea of authority and specifically like implementation of decisions when that you know clinical decision has been made. Gender was not always explicitly discussed, but it was something where we noticed that the female attendings and the responses would talk about, you know, this is how I make my decision and this is how I ensure that it's carried out. Whereas the male attendings were like, this is my thought process and this is how I decide what happens. And then like that's where the discussion ended. 
And I think um, you'll see in the next slide, both like the idea that like men and other underrepresented populations in medicine might not always have their decision making respected or often they're met with questions. And so that like to try and proactively head this off, female attendings describe like explaining my thought process, trying to like build consensus around my decision to ensure that it would be carried out. And one of the ways that they did it was trying to like build those relationships and establish that trust. I think in contrast, a lot of male attendings have their authority respected right off the bat. Um, and it's kind of given to them without, you know, having to build those relationships and things. Obviously there are some limitations. This was a single center study, but I think the fact that like we were still able to find these experiential differences um, make us feel like these are going to exist other places, but that would be a future di um, direction. We also like did not ex ask explicitly about gender, I think again, to try and see like if this difference would happen. And then um, there were no inclusion of non-binary people, um, which I think is just a limitation of our sample size. I know a lot of times qualitative research gets criticized for having a small sample size. So I do want to take a moment to say like we had re um, reached thematic saturation, meaning no like new content um, after a few interviews, making us confident that this is like an adequate sample size. I think the implications were that like we see these um, differences in leadership skills or leadership styles. And um, I think a future direction would be to see if there's differences in outcome in outcomes, whether it's actual like applications of restraints or staff harm or things like that um, outside of just the decision making. That's it. Thank you. Maybe if anyone has questions, we can hold them till the end, but I certainly have questions as well. And let's see, our next speaker is Dr. Batik Lewin. Good morning. <clears throat> Mine's going to be kind of short and sweet, and I want to thank Pooja for her immense um, love and uh, mentorship and support when we talked on the phone and I was like, uh, Pooja, I don't have an update because life has been a little weird. And she's like, that's okay. Let's talk about that a little bit. First, wanting to just describe the project. Um, so my goal and my specific aims were to essentially, through a qualitative interview analysis, try to elicit support solutions and suggestions from interviewees that would help keep women in the academic pipeline, knowing that due to various, various factors, um, we tend to get lost in the academic pipeline um, for just all sorts of reasons. And how can departments better help and support women um, to continue through that pipeline? Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, oh, pipeline, yeah, there's my leaky pipe. So sometimes um, the pipe kind of looks like this, and sometimes the pipe kind of looks like this. Um, and I fell a little bit victim to um, the leaky pipeline, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, methodology, again, qualitative analysis, trying to reach thematic saturation in numerous different buckets that you can see. Um, but things went a little bit wayward. This is actually the plaque that I got for this uh, grant last year. And after my five-year-old pushed it off um, my shelf, it shattered into a million pieces. So sometimes life looks a little bit like this, and sometimes life looks a little bit more like this. So um, towards the end of last year, I left my job in academics, which put a big halt on um, continuing with this project because it gets a little tricky, turns out, when you leave academia and you have grant money and you can't spend it, and then you don't go to a different academic center, so there's no one to transfer the money to. So we kind of had to put a pause. Um, I was able to make another colleague a co-PI on the IRB before I left, and so we're kind of in the process of trying to figure out how to transfer this project kind of to her as she was kind of my right hand gal. And we've interviewed a good handful of women for this, but obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, not enough to reach thematic saturation in any of the buckets. So we're just at a little bit of a 
impasse until we can kind of figure out some logistics. Um, we are, we hopefully soon will be re-recruiting participants. So if you would love to be interviewed, um, if you're a woman in medicine and you want to be interviewed about um, what your thoughts are and how to keep women in the pipeline, feel free to reach out to myself or either um, Taylor Stavely, which will hopefully be kind of taking this project over kind of in that role. And that's what I have for you this morning. Thank you. This on. So as we get our next speaker up, I just wanted to say thank you for coming and sharing that. And I think that's so kind of timely given what we heard at the plenary a couple of days ago. And so just certainly something to think about, right? Life gets in the way. We all try to do all of these things and things happen and that's okay, right? It's still important work that we're trying to do. So thank you for sharing that. All right, so my name is Melissa Parsons. I'm from the University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville. And on behalf of our direct research team, um, I'm happy to present breaking, breaking Through the Glass Ceiling, Networking Best Practices for Women in Emergency Medicine. So uh, we already had my disclosure, but I was funded by a grant in 2020. And so we know that a leadership gap exists in emergency medicine where women in EM are less likely than their male counterparts to serve as chair, vice chair, medical director, or full professor. What we don't know is kind of what things we can do to improve that. And so one of the things in the business literature that we found is networking plays a big role in women's promotion process. But what does networking in emergency medicine look like? What should it look like? And can we take the literature from the business world and apply it to us? And so that was really the question we sought to understand with this project. Uh, so we did a qualitative study with constructivist grounded theory approach. And we did have a sensitizing concept, this study by Carbonia L, how successful women manage their networks. So this study is from the business literature and it provided us with four main themes that they found were important to the promotion of both men and women and kind of where there were similarities and differences between men and women in the business world. So boundary spanning is kind of how, how um, big of a structural network you have. And that was actually one of the big negatives for women is men were more likely to have this expansive, structurally diverse network. I mean, women didn't as commonly have that. Efficiency, how well you can collaborate with others and avoid burnout and collaborative overload. Stickiness, how well you can create and nurture these relationships over time. And they, and they found that women, not surprisingly, were more frequently created these deep, deeper, more mutually beneficial relationships as opposed to the transactional relationships that men often created. And then trust. And trust was found to be the most important thing for uh, promotion in the business world. And it was building engagement and energy with others that you worked with. So we um, collected a group of female physicians in emergency medicine that had reached prominence. And we found them by, they were either chairs or held other institutionally, like high positions at their institution high positions within our national EM organizations, such as president of ASAP, president of SAEM, et cetera, um, or were from a national, nationally published list of uh, influential scholars in emergency medicine. We conducted interviews that were recorded via Zoom and transcribed via Otter AI. And our interview questions were built by a consensus, consensus of our investigators uh, around kind of those four themes that I had already mentioned, as well as barriers and biases that these women faced, how they overcame those obstacles, and how social media played a role in their networking strategies. Uh, we piloted this on other women in emergency medicine. Uh, and then the data. So our, we had a team of coders, basically, and we um, coded based on themes and sub-themes, uh, to try to minimize reflexivity and any biases that we may have from that. We then took that and began axial coding and looking for kind of deeper, more meaningful theory in that process. Um, and that's kind of still where we are at this point. We have, we have data, we're still kind of
kind of at the tail end of putting it all together. So what we have thus far, we had 18 female physicians who completed our interviews. Their demographics, the majority were white, average age was about 52 years old, and 60% were full professors. And when we look at what were the most important strategies in these four realms, we found for boundary spanning and creating that expansive network, creation of outside institution networks was key, specifically attending national meetings such as SAEM, cultivation of sponsor and mentor relationships, and we heard a lot actually about peer mentors, which was great, and then creation of niche connections. So this was one of our quotes I will say most of my big decisions, big moves, big achievements have been influenced by my connections I've made outside my own immediate department. It's establishing connections with people with similar interests but outside your institution. From an efficiency standpoint, saying yes often, especially early in your career, when you do say no, turning down the request based on A, the content doesn't really align with what you want to be doing, or B, the time request that comes with that content and then setting boundaries to prevent collaborative overload. One of the big things we heard about collaborative overload was it's that unpaid extra work that women take on that, that contributes to it. Uh, so this subject 10 gave us a great example of how they go through the process of turning something down. So thinking through, do I have time to do it justice? Is there someone else I can hand it off to? And if I can't do either of those, then is this something that I'm uniquely suited at in this point in my life or bring something special and provides value to me? From a stickiness perspective, every woman that we interviewed said getting to know the person that they're creating that relationship with and having a clear ask about what they're collaborating about was super important. And then this concept of Brownian motion, the article called it churning, but I love that one of our participants renamed it for us as Brownian motion. It's more like this constant Brownian motion sort of thing. What's happening in my life, collaborations, projects, bringing me closer to people, and what's going on in your life bringing you closer. And then some of those things move us apart at times. So almost all of our female uh, respondees said they didn't ever like purposely move someone out of their network other than for dishonesty. You know, but there was just kind of this flux that happens as we go through life and have different stages of our life and stages of our career. And then from a trust standpoint, Proving competence came up repeatedly, and I have two quotes related to that. Uh, creating energy with others by providing a safe space, psychologically safe space for people to bring ideas to and encouraging those ideas, and then building trust by active listening. And so as far as proving competence, have I had to? Yes, multiple times. And I think many times women are asked to prove their competence, maybe more than men, who are just assumed that they know what they're doing and that we're held to a higher bar. Have I had to prove my competence to others? Yes, every day, even to myself. So in conclusion, uh, we hope that this will help us to provide better uh, instruction to our junior faculty going forward. You know, that we have this networking playbook in emergency medicine that we should be able to, to share and teach to others and hopefully will be something that we can spread via AWIM. So thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I think that shows kind of how hard qualitative research is to do, right? It's taken so many years, but the information is just so amazingly intricate and granular and useful that it's certainly a labor of love, but thank you for doing that. Hey guys, good morning. Uh, my name is Jenny Tsai. I'm here to talk about, oops, I think I might have clicked something. Hi. Sorry guys. Oh. 
All right, so gender and race disparities in uh, resident attrition and chief promotion. So to start, uh, we know that gender and race-based discrimination exists widely across different parts and at every level of training in medicine. So this manifests as crude mistreatment, disparities in clerkship grades and honor society inductions, reduced financial compensation, uh, significantly less research funding. And we also know these realities happen at a time when diversity and inclusion in the physician workplace is still a major issue. Among these inequities, uh, some of the ones that stood out to me most were studies that demonstrated harsher and less positive performance reviews for trainees who are women or of color. Um, and I wanted to focus on performance for a number of reasons. One, because the existing literature pointed a pretty damning finger at it. Uh, for example, a recent study found gender disparities in EM milestone scores. Uh, when extrapolated, this gender bias meant that women EM residents would actually need to have an extra three to four months of residency training to graduate at the same level of their male peers. So second, performance evaluations are by nature uh, subjective, which intuitively leaves them especially vulnerable to biases. And third, because performance is uh, inevitably attached to promotion and advancement. Lastly, it felt really salient to me that inequity has a twofold hit on performance. So it's not only that they are biased and unfair appraisals of skill, lack of inclusion itself has been shown to inhibit the performance of marginalized employees. So gender and race-based treatment is related to depression, higher professional turnover, decreased wellness, lower performance. I think this is pretty intuitive. If you are viewed as less capable, if you receive unfair assessments, uh, if you're facing constant microaggressions, if you're feeling in, uh, undervalued at work or facing social isolation, uh, these are obstacles to feeling good and doing well at work. So despite the fact that LCME accreditation standards on diversity have been in place, uh, at the undergraduate level since 2009, 27% of medical schools were deemed non-compliant between 2011 and 2014. Uh, the struggle to meet standards also indicates that a dedicated labor is going to be necessary on the part of residency programs uh, to be able to avoid similar issues. Another statistic that I think is pretty compelling and emblematic, minority physicians are 30% more likely to withdraw from residency eight times more likely to take a leave of absence specifically for performance difficulties. So to focus more specifically on these issues as they pertain to residency, I chose to concentrate on promotion to chief resident. Chief residency is often uh, understood to be a place or position of prestige. It's referred to a stepping stone for academic uh, medicine, marker of future success. And traditionally, it's related to clinical skill and performance, but to date, there's been no empiric data to prove that fact. Uh, this means, once again, that there is significant opportunity for disparities and for biases to infiltrate. So this brought up my own kind of set of questions. Is chief resident selection related to performance? And if it is related to performance, do pre-existing biases impede the promotion of women and trainees of color uh, in this way? Across specialties, women are less likely to be selected for chief resident. Uh, and even when selected, these chief residents report that faculty are less helpful, they're less supportive, and that they feel less uh, prepared. They are also half as likely to self-report that they are leaders, which is a self-appraisal that has been linked to things like higher honors, more academic publications, uh, and increased administrative experiences. Uh, my literature review revealed a paucity of data investigating relationships between race and chief residency. I think it's unsurprising uh, to people in this room specifically that racial and gender disparities significantly impact uh, career trajectories. So more importantly, these are attached to bigger issues. So there's often discussion about recruitment and matriculation, but I also think there's a lot of work to be done around retention and advancement of marginalized trainees. Uh, as such, my initial hypothesis was that there are current racial and gender disparities in chief residency selection in emergency medicine programs. Um, I also hypothesize that these in part reflect parallel disparities in performance evaluations. So using a comprehensive double AMC data set spanning from 2013 to 2017, I found initially that there were no significant gender disparities in chief residency selection for residents who identified themselves as female, self-identify themselves as female compared to those who self-identified as male. Uh, the racial disparities, however, were significant and I think quite compelling. The chance of being selected for promotion to chief resident is meaningfully reduced for residents who identify as Asian or black. So Asian residents face a relative risk ratio of 78%. And black residents are about half as likely as their white counterparts to be selected for chief resident. 
Um, I think what's more important, however, is what happens once we start theorizing a little bit about the mechanisms of inequality. So though men were not significantly more likely to be selected for chief residency compared to women in our unadjusted model, our fully adjusted model, which uh, considered things like race, ethnicity, sex, USMLE step two score, and residency program, demonstrated a significant gender disparity for chief selection that actually favored women. In this fully adjusted model, racial differences in chief promotion for black residents remained significant, uh, though they were attenuated and no longer significant for Asian residents. Uh, I think our most interesting finding comes next, uh, once we started theorizing specifically, again, about intersectionality and the double jeopardy of intersectional identities. So when intersectional identities of both sex and race were taken into account, we found that compared to white male residents, white women were considerably more likely to be selected for chief residency after adjusting for step two score uh, and uh, EM program. So in comparison, URIM, women had the lowest likelihood of being selected for chief resident out of any group with an adjusted risk ratio of uh, 0.5. Of these groups, white women were more and most likely to be selected for chief uh, with a likelihood of selection 1.2 times greater than white male peers. URIM women were least li likely to be selected um, and these findings really emphasize the importance of recognizing double jeopardy of an intersectional identity. So the way that women of color receive compounded unique insults from the axes of both race and gender, um, and that their marginalization is not merely equivalent to the added effects of racism and sexism, but complicated and deepened by their intersecting identities. Uh, so in this nationally representative uh, study of emergency medicine residents, we found significant racial inequities in chief resident selection. Uh, in our fully adjusted model, significant chief disparities persisted for black residents and URIM women, who are both half as likely to receive promotion in comparison to white residents and white men, respectively. So our findings also serve to underscore, uh, underscore the importance of disaggregation, and it demonstrates that white women are actually most likely as intersectional groups to be selected for chief residency, even when compared to white men. It's a reminder that inequality exists in the ways that we ask and do not ask certain questions and our need to be careful in our research questions. Um, our initial analysis did not show any gender inequities and our further exploration actually found that chief resident promotion in fact favors white women most of all. Uh, in this way, it's also a reminder to us the importance of allyship, the ways in which gendered and racialized insults are real, complicated, and different. So I think we need to be proactive in monitoring biases in performance and promotion, especially since we know that these biases recapitulate further um, uh, consequences that impact career tra trajectories in the long term. Thank you so much to A1 for the generous support. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That's, you know, I wonder if we put together your findings and we think about some of the kind of un- um, acknowledged work that women often do. I wonder if there's something interesting there to look at in the future, but this is really amazing. Thank you for doing that. Okay, awesome. Well, my name is Nicole Prendergast. I am a clinical instructor um, at Vanderbilt and also a sports medicine fellow, and I have had the awesome privilege <laughs> To work, to work with an awesome group through uh, Stanford and Kimberly Moulton, who received this grant a few years ago. So I'm really excited to present our research here. I'd like to start off with a quote. Taking care of myself is important. And sometimes taking care of my priorities, and in this case, it could be your children. And one of those things, especially when your children are young, can be lactation. So we're going to discuss some of the barriers and supports to workplace lactation. Um, so what are our aims? So our aims are to identify barriers and supports to workplace lactation in emergency medicine and for all professionals within emergency medicine, not just physicians. Um, so similar to some of the other presentations already, I won't go back into it, but we also used qualitative work um, to assess this. And I think it's uniquely suited um, to be a good thing to evaluate with that. Um, because it involves human behaviors and human emotions. And to get the full extent of that, qualitative research is where we need to lean towards. Um, so here's our research team here. I've been incredibly lucky to work with this wonderful group of women, and I'm really excited to continue to do so moving forward. So about our 
grant. So we started our research initially in 2019, only at Stanford, um, and after receiving the AWEM grant, um, and that was kind of when I was brought onto the project, we were able to kind of expand the clinical diversity of our participants and move to a second site in Atlanta and add on a second group of participants to our first set of data and ask some more questions based on our first part of data as well. So like I mentioned, we looked at emergency professionals in general, so that includes APPs um, and nurses as well. Um, and we had 40 participants, um, but of the, those participants, we had 64 unique return to work experiences. So some of our participants had more than one um, pregnancy and delivery and return to work. So we were able to talk to them about each of those deliveries, which as people who have gone through the snow, it can be different every single time. You can face different challenges each time you return to work. Um, and also want to obviously thank our, our participants who shared some pretty vulnerable experiences with us and was pretty powerful in kind of roping me into continuing to do this work. Um, so what did our interviews look like? So we aimed for about 15 to 30 minutes, but ended up kind of falling a little bit more um, average around 30, ranging from 15 to 102 minutes. Um, and then we also um, had about 23 hours of total data that we were able to pull. And similar kind of to some of the other people that have gone before me, we did coding and we did an iterative analysis to come up with themes. Um, and from that, we actually are kind of going off in two different directions because we had so much data that we could not do this. Um, so I'm gonna to try to talk to bo about both of them briefly. Um, one of them, we have a manuscript out and the other one we're hoping to get out by the summer. The first being ideal lactation space and qualities and the second being return to work. Um, so for ideal lactation space qualities, um, similar, we identified themes. And these are the three themes, and then we had four th sub-themes. So the first being respect of the person, um, which had four sub-themes, um, followed by conducive to the lact of lactation. So what do people actually need in a space to be able to continue with breastfeeding and pumping on shift? And then how is it inclusive to our specialty? And so is the room available? So is it? Do our participants think that it is. So people would go in there to sleep, participant 25. Found staff napping in there, participant 28. Saw others use it as a private bathroom, participant 30. And there were random people just chilling in there, participant 34. Didn't sound to us like this was something that was available. And then is it private? So is there anyone else in this space? And that's part of the respect um, for being able to lactate at work. And we had a participant that said, brave as I am, and I kind of pump wherever I want. The fact is, I don't like that. It's obviously not my first choice to expose my breasts to everyone. Participant five. And where is it? Or am I able to get to it? Lactation space was two or three floors up, so I wasn't going to fight that battle. I was just gonna stop breastfeeding. So we need to be able to get to it. We can't be waiting in line for an elevator and thinking about what patients were missing seeing. And then is it clean? So this seems like it should happen, but it always doesn't happen. And we were amazed at the number of participants that this was not true for. So our lactation room was dirty, and I think there was a roach on the floor, participant 37. And then following from that, is it conducive to lactation? And what do we need in that room once we meet all those qualities that are respectful um, to women um, for breastfeeding and emergency medicine? And these, I'm not gonna read through each of them, um, but these were some of the things our participants were looking for. And in parentheses is the number of participants that were looking for those things in their ideal lactation space when we asked that question. Um, and fridge, we also specified what these things mean, right? And our participants didn't just want a fridge in the room, they wanted a fridge that was in just for lactation. And then finally, are we, are we being inclusive of our specialty emergency medicine in general, right? Because our patients keep coming whether or not we're in the department and whether or not we're actually able to see them. Um, so our participants wanted to have the availability and the ability to be able to look at that. And that just relieved a big component of stress. So I used it to chart and that meant I could get out of my shift earlier, that being the computer. Um, EMR access was ideal. Being in rooms where I didn't have access to a computer made me nervous. And we all know that being nervous it makes it more difficult for lactation. And then the second piece and the one we're kind of currently working on is maternity leave and return to work and how this relates to lactation. And what we've come to find is when we asked the question about what ideal return to work was, we got much more answers than we thought we were going to get and realized that this plays really closely in with lactation in the sense that lactation really affects your return to work and how long you want before you return to work is affected by lactation. Um, so 
in general, women physicians only breastfeed to 12 months about 50% of the time, despite knowing the health benefits um, of doing so. And there have been studies that identified three main reasons why women don't do that. And the first being that they don't want that as a goal, which I don't think is the case, especially for physicians that know that that's beneficial. And the second being the duration of maternity leave and the third being policies. Um, so we decided to go after that second point. And just thinking about it and looking at our data from our participants, you know, returning to work earlier has a higher burden of having to pump on shift and more time away from your infant. Um, um, so what were our objectives then from there? So thinking about the fact that now we know that lactation plays into return to work and return to work affects lactation, we wanted to identify what were the barriers to people returning shorter than their ideal maternity leave time. And what are we doing well and what do we need to do in the future to address these? Um, so I'm running a little bit shorter on time here, but I, I wanted to go through some of the main points, especially leave time. So we asked the question, right? We asked the question about how much time women wanted before they returned to work, and this was one of the big themes. And we also asked questions about these other themes to come up with our four kind of main, or four to five main themes that we wanted to look at. So let's look at leave time in general. Um, and I think the biggest surprising data point here, and maybe it's not so surprising, is that the ideal time is much greater than the time our participants were able to get off, um, to take off with their children, and trainees being the worst. Um, and not only did trainees have the least amount of time that they were able to take, but they also didn't think their ideal should be high either, which is also something to address and also a concern. I think some of the themes that I will talk about that we pulled from the data um, may explain some of that as well. And so, our participants were looking to get around 23.2 weeks, and that's not an arbitrary number. There's something that happens around that time, so that's about six months. So that's when solid foods are introduced. So multiple participants listed that as a reason why this six-month period was extremely important to them, because it relieved the emotional burden of being the only source of nutrition for your newborn. Um, so then this is a quote from Ideal Return to Work, and I'm gonna kind of leave this, and this substantiates that that six months, and multiple people said the same thing. It's bare minimum because your kid is gonna start eating food. Um, so what were the barriers? So we asked, now we're not re meeting what women want for their ideal maternity leave. Why is that the case? And what are we missing, and what do we need to do next? So we identified five of them. The first of them being financial. Um, so it's one thing to say you can have six months of maternity leave, and it's another thing to say you can have six months of paid maternity leave. Some people can't go through the stress of not being paid for that period of time to take that leave. And then benefits came up too. If you want to take a year, do you get to keep your job? Do you get to keep your benefits? Can you actually afford to do that? The second pertains pretty closely to trainees, um, and that's extension of duration of training. And that affects job prospects and fellowship as well. Um, the third being guilt. Who is working those shifts? Guilt of clinical burden. Who's working those shifts when you're not there? Um, is it, are they getting compensated properly for those shifts that they're working for you? Um, the fourth being delivery timing. We can't control when we leave for maternity leave. There's one thing you sometimes can't control and that's when you give birth. Um, and if you give birth two weeks late, do you get those two weeks extra as maternity leave or because you're not on a clinical schedule, do you lose those two weeks on your maternity leave? And then finally, family. Accommodations, what your family situation looks like. So then, you know, we were kind of looking at all these things and saying these are all barriers, these are all things we need to work on, but what are we doing well and what is one thing we can point to? We have these, and a lot of institutions have strict policies, and yes, we need to go after each of those policies, but what has been done to try to make steps in the right direction, and we have been doing that, and we should encourage people to keep doing that, and that's this. This is scheduling accommodations. So whether that's from an overall policy perspective or that's individually scheduling accommodations from a scheduler, a colleague, this has made a significant difference to a lot of our participants and should be something that we continue to think about formalizing um, or continue to try to do individually each of us if we're working with people returning to work. And all of these things, then in turn affect lactation and what time people ask for. And that is all I have. I kind of wanted to leave this up here, but there's many calls to action and we're hoping that our data can help substantiate some of these and help change some of these national policies. 
you. That was fantastic. I feel badly that there's no time for questions because I have questions for everybody. Um, but I just want you all to think about kind of the, the topics you heard about, the speakers that we that we listened to, these amazing researchers. Think about who, how you yourself can be involved in this space, um, your junior residents, your, your students who might be someone you can pull into a, a funding mechanism like this and also promote kind of some of these, some of these efforts. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And I'm sure if these folks have any, and if they have a few questions for them, you can reach out to them. I have their contact information right there. So thank you.